A senior NASA employee in 1958 gave the first American team Daedalus members the noble mission of conducting atmospheric testing in space for the benefit of their country. But NASA suddenly replaces them with a chimpanzee right before launch. Yet years later, during orbital testing, NASA discovers a fault with the satellite and offers Team Daedalus members a chance to fix it. Will they agree to help? Let's find out the answer in the movie. In 1958, the U.S. Air Force pilot and aspiring astronaut William Hawk Hawkins planned to break a height record using the modified Bell X-2. He invites his co-pilot, also an aspiring astronaut, Frank Corvin, to fly with him, who agrees, and they begin operating the aircraft. While maneuvering it, the Bell X-2 suddenly gets into an engine failure and they need to eject it before it crashes to the ground. But instead of ejecting it, Hawk decides to push the aircraft higher into the sky. Then, he only ejects after reaching 112,000 feet, which pisses off Frank because Hawk does not even think they could get scolded by their boss, Bob Gerson. Upon landing on the ground, Hawk celebrates their success of breaking a height record when suddenly Frank punches him. Hawk fights back until a flight engineer, Jerry O'Neill, appears to break them up. Later, Frank and Hawk enter Bob's office to admit that they crashed Bell X-2, and at the same time, Hawk reports that they break both speed and altitude records, saying they beat the freefall mark by 30,000 feet, but Bob still chastises him for destroying three planes in three months. Afterward, Bob takes Frank and Hawk, along with other members, Tank and Jerry, to the press conference. He then announces that the U.S. president officially terminates the U.S. Air Force to run the Daedalus aircraft for outer atmosphere testing. And a newly built civilian agency, NASA, is replacing the U.S. Air Force to operate Project Daedalus, the pilot of which will be a chimpanzee. In the present day, mission director Sarah Holland attends a meeting at NASA. She reports to NASA's upper management that 11 days ago, the orbital deterioration of the Soviet communications satellite, ICON, was detected using atmospheric tracking. There is a total system failure in the online navigation and guidance avionics. If nothing changes the ICON's course, it will crash into the Earth's atmosphere in 30 to 40 days. Due to this, NASA's flight director, Gene, asks Bob, now a project manager of NASA, to report the solution to ICON's system failure. Bob then takes the microphone from Sarah and tells them that NASA is given a presidential mandate to assist the Russians in fixing the problem. When she discovers Bob lied about mending the satellite by collaborating with the Russians, she confronts him about it after the meeting. So, Bob explains that such deception is necessary for pilots to avoid a conflict between the United States and Russia. While he goes to the operating room, Sarah is left dumbfounded after hearing Bob's answer. Once inside, Bob instructs astronaut Ethan to disable the ICON's guiding system, but Ethan refuses, claiming that he is unfamiliar with the ICON's antiquated technology. Meanwhile, Sarah orders Ethan to access the Skylab files so she can determine how they can operate the guidance system correctly. Bob gets confused by Sarah's orders, for he thinks the ICON is designed by some engineer, not from Skylab. Eventually, he buys into Sarah's notion and learns that Frank, his former colleague, who developed the icon's dated electronics. A while later, Ethan and Sarah visit Frank at his house and introduce themselves as one of NASA's staff members. Sarah then informs him that his designed satellite guidance system on board is about to re-enter the atmosphere and NASA needs his help to crack it. This prompts Frank to address the issue over to his place after discovering that the guidance system he developed was secretly implemented in Russia's satellite. Frank then admits that Bob is a possible culprit since he is the one who claims credit for Frank's designs and misuses it. Following his statements, Sarah explains that Bob is the new NASA project manager assigned to this issue. Frank still holds a deep animosity for Bob, so he asks Ethan and Sarah to allow him the night to decide if he will help. The following day, Frank visits NASA, assuring Sarah that he will find ways to decipher the satellite's guiding system. Sarah feels happy and quickly takes him to Bob's office for a private discussion. Once inside, Frank orders Bob to send Hawk, Tank, and Jerry from Team Daedalus to help him fix the damaged satellite. 
Bob's defiance, however, forces Frank out of his office and gives him time to reevaluate whether or not to dispatch the team. Left with no choice, Bob follows Frank outside to accept his deal since he is the only answer to retrieve the satellite. But before sending them, Bob tells his terms, saying that the Daedalus team will work together with NASA's younger astronauts. Frank agrees, for he thinks that it will be fair for both sides. Soon, the Daedalus team members reunite and go to NASA together to meet Sarah, who takes them to the press conference. She then introduces them as the astronauts selected for the mission in space in order to prevent the icon from decaying out of orbit. During the conference, Sarah says that the goal of Team Daedalus and the young astronauts is to catch the icon using the shuttle's grappling arm, which gives them a 42-hour allotted time to repair its guidance system. Once accomplished, they will use the payload assist's model rockets to send the icon back into geosync orbit. After Sarah's report, Flight Director Gene says that the younger astronauts should be sent instead of Team Daedalus because they already know how to retrieve satellites. So, Bob ensures that only Frank and his team repair the guidance system. Since that is the case, Gene also makes his deal after learning that Bob and Frank made an agreement, telling them that he will not offer another new space shuttle for Team Daedalus unless they go for training and take two of his trained young astronauts with them. He even suggests taking Ethan and Roger because they are the best astronauts in his pipeline, to which Bob and Frank agree. A while later, Team Daedalus begins physical training with a female doctor making regular post-workout checks to see how they are holding up. Once done training, Sarah visits Hawk in the men's room. She informs him that Gene will run the stimulator by 11 o'clock, so he needs to be there beforehand and gives him a file to study the procedures of operating the space shuttle. Sarah is about to leave when suddenly Hawk invites her out for a drink, to which she accepts. After a while, Team Daedalus goes through its first mission training, during which NASA personnel wheel them inside a simulator to test their strength. While on training, Gene suddenly emerges, turns off the simulator, and chastises the NASA personnel for tampering with Team Daedalus. Later at night, Team Daedalus goes to a bar to relax after their first day of successful training. Jerry dances with a woman, Tank plays in the claw machine, and Hawk and Frank play billiards. However, Hawk and Frank end up bantering and punching each other's faces outside the bar. The following day, the four of them continue training for a mission when suddenly, Gene notices Hawk and Frank's black eyes. Therefore, he asks them what happened, but they only fabricate excuses by saying they got slipped to the ground. This is because they don't want Gene to find out any further reason not to ship them off to space. Later, Hawk and Frank begin working with Ethan and Roger inside a flight simulator while Gene serves as their supervisor. While training, Gene orders the senior astronauts to exchange seats with the young ones. He then tells them to demonstrate their proficiency in bringing a space shuttle to a touchdown. Due to this, Hawk and Frank show off the skills they learned without a computer. They attempt to do a manual control, ignoring Ethan and Roger's reminder to follow the onboard computer's instructions. Consequently, they fail to land correctly, and Frank tells Hawk to do it Gene's way in operating the space shuttle or they will be terminated again. Left with no choice, Hawk requests a secondary landing, but this time he commands to have onboard computer shut down. Gene then lets Hawk do his favor and watches him manually control the landing. Surprised, they see Hawk successfully touch down the space shuttle without the computer's aid. Later at night, Hawk celebrates his first mission training success with Sarah by taking her out for a beer. After some time of charming talk, they eventually lock their lips. The following day, Team Daedalus receives another task from Gene. To help them adjust to life on the ship, Gene will recreate the conditions they will encounter. Afterward, he has them enter the space shuttle where they will work with NASA experts to learn how to pilot the ship. On their fourth training day, Frank discovers that Bob has been plotting their failure to prevent them from being sent into space. For verification, he visits his office and is shown Jerry's paperwork, which reveals Hawk failed the physical training because he has pancreatic cancer. But Frank doesn't believe him and calls for a second opinion from a different physician to double check. Due to this, Bob realizes that Frank wants a seat for Hawk in space regardless of his condition, indicating his ambitious desire. Bob then clarifies that he is concerned about Hawk 
and is trying not to send them off to space. But the vice president is trying to get the Daedalus team, excluding Hawk, involved in the operation so they can get some press. Therefore, even if Frank decides to cancel for Hawk's sake at the last minute, his decision will be null and void. The following day, Sarah informs Frank that all Team Daedalus members will launch in 92 hours and reminds him to get his team a rest and prepped. She tells him that she was able to convince Bob to let Hawk come with them. At long last, the full complement of Team Daedalus board the ship, and Ethan and Roger are among them. In the front seat are Hawk and Frank to control it, while the rest sits in the back. Minutes later, the shuttle space Daedalus finally lifts off, and the astronauts are given the order to throttle up. Once the solid rocket boosters separate from the space shuttle, Hawk and Frank receive permission to go for orbit ops. Because of that, they start controlling the ship and soon find the Icon satellite. But upon seeing it, Team Daedalus discovers that it is not a communication satellite because it has a self-defense mechanism activated by the ship's radar. This prompts Frank to stand by and observe more of the Icon satellite since he is unfamiliar with its parts. However, Gene orders Team Daedalus to go for capture, so Hawk starts operating the grappling arm to catch the Icon satellite. When they are finished, Frank, Jerry, and Ethan exit the ship and enter the navigational system. Then, Frank turns on the lights for the subjects and radios his team to investigate the satellite's control center. But upon checking it, he confirms it is not a communication satellite because it conceals six nuclear missiles. Therefore, Frank orders the team to abort the activity for he can't help the Russians put a missile silo back into orbit. Afterward, he talks to Gene and tells him what he discovered. This leads the Russian general to reveal that the Icon satellite is a Cold War relic floating around in orbit, unresponsive since the collapse of the USSR and the missiles will target strategic American installations in large metropolitan areas once ICON goes offline. Technically, the satellite's computers will automatically launch and create a catastrophe. Fuming mad, Bob reminds the Russian general that it violates the Outer Space Treaty and shows concern for the astronauts' safety in space. Meanwhile, Frank interrupts and inquires the Russian general about how his guiding system from Skylab made it onto the missiles. The Russian general replies that it was stolen by the Committee for State Security from Bob's personal files. Since that is the case, Frank immediately comes up with an idea to resolve the big problem. He asks Jerry if they can push the satellite into deep space using the four payload assist rockets, which Jerry answers affirmatively. On the other hand, Gene informs Frank that they detect Ethan is outside the ship doing something with the satellite. Frank and Team Daedalus members then look up and try to take him back inside, but Jerry finds that Ethan jammed the airlock door, so Frank orders him to remove the panel and override it. Afterward, Frank uses their communicator to ask Ethan what he is doing, only to learn that he plans to put the icon back into geosync orbit. This alarms Frank, who immediately orders Ethan to stop, for he doesn't know the consequences of it. However, Ethan refuses, causing Frank to command Roger to suit up and take Ethan back to the ship as soon as Jerry fixes the door. But it's too late. Ethan has set off a chain reaction which knocks himself out as the satellite drags him around space. Besides, the chain reaction causes the satellite's parts to shatter and destroy the space shuttle. The computer system and engines of the space shuttle take the brunt of the damage, followed by the destruction of the satellite's solar panel. As a consequence, the Icon satellite is quickly decaying out of orbit, and Roger got a concussion from the collision. Nevertheless, Team Daedalus still attempts to operate the space shuttle and uses a fire extinguisher to cool the burning heat. Afterward, Frank plans on reconfiguring the flight control system to stabilize the burn and rely on Hawk to alert him when the satellite rotates into view and aligns with the space shuttle. Hawk then asks Frank how he plans to deal with the decent pace after the tumble has been halted, to which Frank replies that he will use a brief payload assist module burst to counter-thrust the satellite. This means that Hawk should enable the PAM to obey Frank's orders. Knowing it will be hard for the two of them, Frank seeks Jerry's assistance to give them a range of opening readings. Jerry agrees and reminds Frank that he has only one shot at making it successful because there are no more second chances for him to make it back if he misses. Once outside the ship, the two begin to spacewalk to the satellite and activate the pan. 
On the other hand, Jerry tells Frank that he only has 15 seconds to ignite it. This prompts Frank to take immediate steps to prevent further orbital decay of the satellite. Fortunately, his plan is victorious and he takes a chance to get Ethan back inside. However, Hawk reveals that Ethan might be dead and informs Frank that he will get more payload assist modules to hook them up to the satellite. But then, they ran into a problem. There is one rocket left. Also, the satellite has two broken panels, which means increasing the amount of PAM will necessitate additional energy to mitigate the rate at which its orbital decay occurs. Hawk volunteers to take care of the satellite and commands Frank to take Ethan back inside the ship, requesting Frank to give him extra O2 modules. With barely eight months to live, Hawk decides to end his life on the moon by self-destructing the missiles that would send him there. Hawk then bids goodbye to the Daedalus team, for he will no longer return to Earth and expects himself to land on the moon since he always has the dream of getting to that natural satellite before he dies. Having no other choice, Team Daedalus lets Hawk do what he wants, and Frank gets back inside the ship alone. Afterward, he asks Jerry about the ship's status, who says that the fire took out one orbital engine and primary and secondary guidance system. Therefore, Frank must do a successful touchdown by himself since Hawk and Ethan are the only pilots that can manually operate the space shuttle. Meanwhile, Gene reports to Sarah that the Icon has left the Earth's gravitational field after Hawk successfully launches the warheads into outer space. Afterward, he reveals that the space shuttle's situation is dire because the accident disabled its remaining orbital maneuvering engine and caused fuel to flow out. This means Frank will have to place it down in manual mode because the airflow is the only power source left. On the ship, Frank and Tank manually maneuver the space shuttle, but before they start the engine, Gene orders them to touch down in Florida as NASA will get them as close to Kennedy as possible. Then, he stands by them for a deorbit turn since they don't have much fuel in the engine. Frank quickly follows Gene's order and maneuvers the space shuttle to return to Earth. While setting for landing, Jerry safely evacuates Ethan and Roger. He and Tank tell Frank that they will stick by his side no matter what happens. Frank then lets them and focuses on maneuvering the space shuttle wherein he adopts Hawk's technique. He applies little pressure to the brakes in order to raise the angle of attack of a space shuttle, putting it dangerously close to stalling. As a result, the shuttle rapidly slows down and the three safely touch down without suffering any injuries. Meanwhile, NASA personnel in the operation room celebrate their success and Bob finally gives Frank the credit he deserves by praising his piloting skills. Later at night, Frank and his wife Barbara stare up at the moon and speak about how they hope Hawk made it there. The movie ends with the song Fly Me to the Moon by Frank Sinatra playing in the background as a shot of the moon's surface is shown to reveal that Hawk did land on the moon before being killed when the satellite blew up on its own.